Hi, everyone. So I was thinking about this subject for today and why estate planning is for everyone. And I think it's important to note that there has been this feeling uh, amongst uh, financial advisors, if you read the literature and magazines, avoid probate at all costs. And last week I spoke about one reason why you might want to avoid probate with regard to COVID. We'll get back to that. But in general, avoiding probate should not be the guiding principle in your estate plan. And different people at different ages have different considerations. So I thought I would start out in a simple case with respect to young people with children. Why might they want to do an estate planning? Now, it's not uncommon for a younger couple, say someone in their 20s or their 30s, to have a, um, an estate plan where they leave everything to each other and then to their children, they have some trust, and they might decide, well, I really don't have enough assets in order to do a, a will. I don't want to spend the money for the will. I'll just name my spouse on my accounts on my 401k, on my IRA, on any retirement assets. And it's not uncommon also for them to have life insurance and they would name their spouse. The question is who do they name as the secondary beneficiary? And all too often what I see is that they name their children. And that's where the problem is because lots of times when you have someone that young, their children are minors. And if you name them as beneficiaries, that means a court proceeding. So if you have a life insurance policy worth a few hundred thousand dollars and you and your spouse both die, it names minor children, what happens is the policy has to be cashed in and the money would be administered through a guardian appointed through the court. So that's more proceedings, more money, and the money ends up in a bank account and is turned over to them when they're 18 years old which is usually what most people don't want to happen. Whereas even for a young couple with small children, if they have a will, they will name a trust of the child and then benefits like life insurance could pass through the will and go into the trust of the children. It's also, if they have multiple children, they may want a common trust to capture all the money to support the entire family and then divide into separate trusts once the um, children reach a certain age. Usually we say when the youngest child reaches 25, with the idea that the money would be there, similar to a family, in order to pay for the house in which the children live, um, and whether they go off to college or not, there's always a home for them to live in. And then once the youngest child is educated, divide it into separate trusts, and usually at that time, the children become trustees of their own money. That's a lot different than the child getting the money at 18 as per court order. So having a simple plan, and, and most young people have 401ks, or they have IRAs, or they have life insurance um, if they've been working. And the way in which to manage it is to at least have a will that provides for the minors. So even for a young couple, that makes sense. In addition, one of the biggest issues is who do they name as a guardian for their children? And what I find is a lot of people don't do their plan because they can't agree on who the guardian for the children should be. But it's very important to name a guardian. Now, the court is not constrained to name the person in your will that you name as a guardian. However, they will give great weight to that. Um, so a will for a young couple, naming a, a trustee for their children, a guardian for their children, alternate executors and collecting all the assets in case there's not a surviving spouse is very important. By the way, children are going off to college if they are going off to college this year. They should have a healthcare proxy, a living will and a power of attorney. And it has never been so clear as it has been going through what we've done. Young people do get sick. Who is empowered to make decisions? What type of decisions can you make for them? A uh, living will, power of attorney for financial decisions, and a healthcare proxy, even for your children going off to college over 18, is a must. Um, the other thing is, oftentimes I find grandparents who name grandchildren as beneficiaries skipping their children. For instance, 
uh, a grandmother will say, well, I have this annuity, a couple hundred thousand, it's going to my grandchildren. They name the grandchildren and their minors. That's a coordinated effort. They should have a trust under their documents that pays any money to a grandchild to a trust for them. Uh, the other thing is when I speak to people of a modest means, say in house, some retirement funds, some insurance, maybe some bank accounts, in the elder law context, usually they want to do estate planning to protect assets in case they need long-term care. In that case, we use a Medicaid qualifying trust. Uh, usually that's the best way to do it. They get to use the asset during their lifetime. They get to have the income if it's a bank account or any type of uh, stock dividends or if it's a house, they have the right to live there. They get their star exemption. It's their house tax-wise. They get the deductions. It passes to whoever they choose at their death. If there's a husband and wife, usually it continues to the life of both spouses and then passes. That Medicaid qualifying trust uh, avoids probate and also protects the asset. And I will tell you that 99 out of 100 times when we name a, um, a beneficiary on a will or a trust, we leave it in trust for them. And if it's a children or grandchildren, we call it a descendant's trust. If it's um, a niece or nephew or non-child, we call it an inheritance trust. It's the same thing. And I think that has happened as estate taxes have risen uh, the exemption has risen. Most people come to me and say, how do I protect my heirs? Half of marriages end in divorce. People could end up needing long-term care. Uh, they, they may have to be protected from themselves. Sometimes they need to be protected from others. How do I do it? How do I protect my heirs? And the only way to do it is to leave it in a trust for them. And when you do that, they're able to, if you're not trying to protect them from themselves, right? They can be their own trustee. They can pay assets to themselves for health, education, maintenance, support. They can appoint an independent trustee like that who can give them distributions for any reason. And yet it will be protected from their creditors, the IRS, divorcing spouses, nursing home care. Um, it just makes a lot of sense to leave it to them in trust. And quite frankly, if they want to take it out of the trust, there's a provision for that as well. The only time we don't have that ability to terminate the trust is if you're trying to protect the heir from themselves. In that case, you are naming an independent trustee who will make distributions to them and make those types of decisions. So certainly asset protection, both Putting assets in a Medicaid qualifying trust with a five-year look back, if you later need to get long-term care for yourself, makes sense. And the trust after your death that pays into a descendants or inheritance trust makes sense too because it's asset protection for your heirs. Um, it, the other, there are other ways to avoid probate other than direct beneficiary. So that's the problem. I told you if you name a minor, they cannot collect the money, a guardian has to be appointed as a court proceeding. But what about if you name a living trust as a beneficiary for your uh, children or grandchildren and minor children? That way works too. Sometimes I have clients that create a revocable trust that ends in descendants trust for their children. And while they may not fund the trust during their lifetime, it's funded at their death. The beneficiary on the products would be the trust, or the trust could own the asset, and it says upon my death it goes to whatever trust is named in there. So you can avoid probate by doing a trust um, and naming that trust as a beneficiary. One of the other problems is if you take a young person without any uh, trust at all or any will, and they uh, die with assets, then we're talking about an administration proceeding. And one of the big problems with the administration proceeding, which looks like a probate proceeding, you still have to give notice to heirs and different beneficiaries. But the problem is they 
they'll have to post a bond. So if you look at any will, uh, one of the first paragraphs is that the executive does not have to get a bond. But in an administration proceeding where there is no will, then the court will order a bond. And that's another cost and expense to the estate that could be avoided with a will. Um, of course, the other reason, the other thing that we do in terms of planning is tax planning. Um, and right now, the federal exemptions are high, well over 11 million. New York State is high. But as I said last week, I expect that exemption to be reduced greatly by the stimulus bills, both the ones that have passed and if there are more. The government is going to have to find some way to pay for the stimulus payments, and I think it's going to happen in estate taxes. But presently, we have a husband, uh, you know, a, a married couple. We save taxes by creating documents that have a family trust and a marital trust, and that can avoid taxes until the death of the second spouse. Um, and we often use that. And by the way, we can do the family trust and marital trust either in a will document or we can do it in a revocable trust document. Uh, again, the benefit of doing a revocable trust is that we avoid probing. If the assets are already in the trust and the first spouse dies, we then fund the assets to a family trust up to the New York State exemption. And if there's any amount over that, to the marital trust for the benefit of the spouse. Um, very effective. Uh, we used them uh, and funded them more when the exemptions were low, but I think you will see a lot of documents and you should see a lot of documents that have that provision using a formula because we don't know what the future holds. The other thing, like I said last week, is there was a time when I would say, you don't need a revocable trust. Uh, that you can accomplish what you need to accomplish with doing a will. And what COVID has told me is the courts can close down for three months or more. And when that happens, everything stops. So if you have a revocable trust, whether you become incapacitated or upon your death, the trustee can continue to act whether the courts are open or not. So I am definitely leaning towards revocable living trust, which is the first time in the 25 years I've been doing this that I can tell you that I am highly in favor of that. And also the provisions that are in the revocable trust so that the agent that you name or you yourself can do whatever has to be done. So in terms of uh, planning for um, a couple of high net worth clients, you talk about tax planning, avoiding probate, asset protection for them, and asset protection for their descendants. For a younger couple, you're talking about creating trust for their minor children and also providing for a guardian for them and making sure that all assets coming from retirement funds, insurance, and other non-probate assets are paid into the trust for the, the children. Naming the guardian is very important, but it can very well keep people from actually doing their will because they can't agree on who the guardian would be. I, I definitely think that children going to college, anyone over 18, especially in view of COVID, should have a healthcare proxy, a living will, and a power of attorney, and also something called a HIPAA release. And that's a release that allows not only your agent named in the order under healthcare proxy, but a number of people who are entitled to HIPAA, uh, or entitled to health information. Um, and that if you have a child that's off in college, you want not just the healthcare agent, but maybe either parent or another sibling to be able to call up and get information about them and what their condition is. So healthcare proxy, living will, which is a statement of their intentions if they were uh, not likely to recover, a HIPAA release for disclosure, and a power of attorney for finances. Um, does anyone have any questions? I don't see any questions at the moment. Okay. Great. 
Well, thank you, everyone. Have a nice day and see you next time.